As you may be able to tell, there was a wedding here last night. White ribbons, groomsmen, bridesmaids, flower girls, beautiful dresses, veils, and vows. Will you take this woman to be your wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for richer, for poorer? I will, he said. I do, she said. The couple exchanged rings, we prayed, and off they went to an elegant and beautiful reception. Yes, there was a wedding here at St. Paul's last night. Yet here today, we talk about, oh, what was it again? <laughs> there are a lot of themes floating through the air today. A lot of themes. We have just ahead the Feast of St. Francis, which celebrates the earth and creation. We have our community giving campaign, which begins today. We are still shaking in the waters after the death of our brother, Jack Spong. We're preparing for an ordination this afternoon and the funeral of Tom Burns next Saturday. There are a lot of themes going on, but I feel like it is important for us to address this topic of divorce, which is mentioned today. And if we look closely and dig around a little bit, we'll probably see that all of these themes have more to do with each other than you might imagine. After all, divorce is something that has probably touched us all. And now here it is mentioned in church, in Scripture, in God's holy word. We must give it our attention. Why? Because I've heard so many people feel shame and guilt and judgment and fear from the church when it comes to divorce. I once had a friend who was a good Episcopalian and this meant that they would always read ahead and see what the readings were going to be. And they did not go to church on the day that this passage was read. I was afraid of what I would hear, they said. No doubt divorce is hard. Anytime, every time, in every setting, divorce is hard. The root words of the word divorce have to do with turning away or turning aside. There are times when the divorce is a more simple decision and a simpler process, and there are times when divorce is tortuous, not an easy process, especially if children are involved. And then there's the societal shame that we feel if things don't work out. What will other people think? Divorce. So why is Jesus talking about divorce today? After all, wasn't Jesus single? <laughs> well, that's what we're led to believe by Scripture. But really, who can be sure? The first thing to point out today as we launch into this weighty topic is that Jesus is being set up. He's being trapped. Scripture even says that right there, puts it out there. The religious authorities are asking him another one of those questions that is kind of impossible to answer. And it does surround the topic of divorce. And why? Well, as we learned from a scholar back in Lent, if a topic like this is being discussed in Scripture, it probably means that it is happening somewhere in the culture. And my friends, I'm here to tell you today that according to most scholars, divorce was commonplace in Jesus' times. In fact, in Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4, we are told the proper ways to get divorced. 
But those rules do not include practices that protect the woman involved in those proceedings. The women were often left in a cloud of scandal and poverty and homelessness. I think of the story of Ruth. Ruth, you know, that quintessential scripture that's read in the pulpit at weddings, like the one we had last night. I will go where you go. Your people will become my people. And for most people, this conjures up visions of a faithful wife talking to her husband. But guess what? The conversation is between two women. Those words are spoken by a daughter-in-law to her mother-in-law. Because Naomi had two sons, and when those sons died, they left behind wives. And Naomi was telling Orpah and Ruth, go and prosper, which means go and take care of yourself and get yourselves another spouse so that you'll be safe. And Ruth says, no way. I'm going with you, Naomi, mother-in-law. And I don't know about you, but that is a real signal of faith to me. The cultural norms were not so protective of women who were divorced. Which is exactly why Jesus is lifting it up today. He's not pointing out the wrongness of divorce per se, but he is pointing out the mistreatment of society's most vulnerable. He's pointing to the much larger topic of those who are unprotected, overlooked, and cast aside. And to make that case more clear, Jesus once again points to who? The children. Jesus, what is up with the children? We've heard about children three weeks in a row. Again, think about it. In that day, in Jesus' day, the children were comparable to servants. They had no status. They were unvaccinated. They were vulnerable. They had no rights. So in case you missed it for the past two weeks, previously in this pulpit at St. Paul's, regarding children, Ben preached, the passage said, then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one such child as this welcomes me, and not only welcomes me, but welcomes the one who sent me. How are we treating our children? Ben asked. And then last week, Gwen talked about the Jesus who still had those children in his arms when he was talking about how dangerous it is to trip up the vulnerable, to put obstacles in their path. No, don't do that, Jesus says. And then today, Jesus has moved to a completely different location, but he's still talking about the children. And today, the category of the vulnerable is now expanded as Jesus opens up another way that the vulnerable are left to cobble together their own futures in the wake of blind, established power. So for those of you who fear that the content of our reading today, let me assure you that this is not about divorce. It's about how we are called to live in relationship with each other and to care for each other. We're pointed back to Genesis. We're pointing back to Genesis as we hear that God created all manner of creatures, but God had not quite found a proper partner for the human. And so God from the human formed another human. And now this is my own scholarship, but in the reading I've done, the purpose here was not to establish a binary relational system of male and female. The creation of two humans was driven by God's desire for partnership proper partnership, which means a desire for you and I to share in beneficial, creative, 
productive relationships with each other and with creation. That word, have dominion over the earth, is better said in cooperation with. So now just another word about relationships. Some of us are called to be married. Some of us are called to be single. That's okay. Not everyone is called to the vocation of marriage. But all of us, according to Genesis, are called to be in relationship. Married or single, our nature is to be in relationship, and relationships always involve hard work and faithfulness, no matter what they look like. You can talk to the singlest, most single monk out there. And there will be monks who say that life would be a dream if it weren't for other monks. (laughs) Each unique relationship comes with a responsibility to care for the other, especially the vulnerable. And... I'm always moved when I'm in those religious communities who have taken vows to care for each other. When one of them gets old and sick and they care for them until the very end, in sickness and in health. So what does it mean to be vulnerable? Especially now, we probably know a lot about vulnerability. Well, it comes from words meaning to injure or to hurt. And as I think about the great gift that it means to be in relationship, it means that we put ourselves out there to be cared for and to be wounded. And to understand the vulnerable, the vulnerable nature of relationships, we look no further than to the body of Jesus. Yes, Even God knows the broken sadness of divorce because humanity divorced itself from Jesus. In human form, God entered into relationship with humanity, and in human form, God was wounded and cast aside, rejected. So today is not about the kind of divorce that we might immediately think about. It's more about the divorce that happens from being a human being. It is about the tendency we all have to lose sight of our relationship with God and with our planet. We're all divorced from something, aren't we? And while divorce is not a get-out-of-jail-free card, We trust in the God that brings hope and health out of the ruptures of our lives. And my friends, that's where the church comes in. That's why you and I are here. One of my mentors used to say, the church is not a place for perfectly put together people. It's a place for broken people. So what's the church about? What's the role of the church? You hear me say this way too much. It's in the prayer book. The role of the church, the mission of the church, is to restore all people to unity with God and with each other. To bring people back together. It's about pulling us all from our broken places. It's about bringing us together from here and there. The church even calls forth those vulnerable places. When we come into this place and we sing and we pray and all of a sudden tears are rolling down our cheeks and we're like, my God, where'd that come from? Where did that come from? I didn't know it was there. The church is here for the vulnerable, the cast aside. In fact, the centerpiece of our Christian churches is a cross where vulnerability is most blatantly laid bare. So today is a Sunday we celebrate the beauty of creation. Begun in Eden, two companions trying to find their way toward each other and toward God, two companions that dropped the ball. 
the first divorce. And that's why every Sunday we come here and we celebrate a resurrection. Because Jesus, in all of his vulnerability, brings these two companions, Adam and Eve, Adam and Steve, Eve and Evelyn, him and her, her and him, we and us, they and them, into unity. That cross, through the ages, celebrates and transforms the way that God calls us to be us. Divorced, maybe. Different, definitely. But, by God, still in relationship. And always trying, step by step, wound by wound, band-aid by band-aid, to come closer to God and each other through the wounds of the most vulnerable one. And again, I think this is why God has placed St. Paul's on so many people's journeys. On this Sunday that we begin our community giving campaign, I'd like to put the emphasis on the word community. Now more than ever, we're called to pull together that which has been torn asunder. From the various places of our journeys, God has called us to receive a divorced humanity We are here to receive those who feel separated and cast aside. And maybe you know some of those people. And if you do, invite them here. Invite them here because you know what it feels like to be invited and welcomed. You can talk about what it's like to hear those words from the altar, words that always bring us together, the gifts of God for the people of God. And then with every ounce of vulnerability we're willing to share, we move with the support of our siblings toward this altar and receive the broken body of Jesus. The Jesus who you might remember said similar words to those who stood right there last night. Do you take these people in sickness and in health to love and to cherish until death do you part? And Jesus says, I do. Every Sunday, every day, Every moment, Jesus says, I do.